Well, good morning and welcome. Um, it's very good to be here, both in person and online. So thank you for those of you who joined us in the room in Geneva, and for those of you online, you're very welcome. And I guess good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are as well. Um, on behalf of the Norwegian Refugee Council and the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, which is part of the Global Protection Cluster, um, we're really pleased to welcome you here today. I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the Global Coordinator of the uh, HLP AOR, as it's known, the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility. And we're really pleased that you're here with us to have this discussion around climate change and disaster displacement, looking at some sort of key knowledge gaps around housing, land and property rights to try and really bring these things together in a way that hasn't been done too much before. So just a quick couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we're running this as a hybrid event, as you've seen. Um, so it's great that you're here online. If you could just please keep your microphones muted. Um, unless you'd be given the floor to ask a question or make a comment, of course. And I suppose we should say the same in the room if we can keep ourselves muted. I don't know. It always seems like we need some kind of equal uh, application. I think we all know how these things work now. So just, you know, let's all be kind and enjoy our discussion. Secondly, just to let you know, we're going to be recording the session so we can sort of share that in the future. But I know some already have been in touch saying they can't make it, but we'd be interested to hear the discussion. And we've got some really fascinating speakers uh, today. Um, and we will hear from them, but we also want this to be a sense of, you know, conversation, dialogue. Yeah, it's a, it's a smaller group. We can do that. We want to have a bit of exchange. So there's going to be plenty of time for questions and comments and uh, as well. So I'm going to be managing the time. I'm not particularly harsh as a person, but when it comes to timekeeping, whoo, watch out. <laughs> no. So, um, yeah, please do engage with us uh, however you feel comfortable. You can do that online, even if you're in the room and you want to submit your, your questions via the Teams link, you're very welcome to. Um, it sometimes helps to have all those things in, in one place. There's microphones in the ceiling magically, so we can speak and be heard online. So, um, yeah, we can use that as well. So the session is going to draw on a real wealth of experience, as you can see up there on the screen, uh, both policy and practice. And uh, we're going to hear from colleagues working in the Pacific, Mozambique, Somalia, as well as from a global perspective as well. Um, but before then, I just want to offer a few remarks on housing, land and property, partly just to say, you know, what is this HLP thing? And then also to situate it within the context of this discussion. So just a, a few minutes from me and then we'll get to our, to our speakers. Which I'm really looking forward to hearing. So as global temperatures increase with climate change, so is the intensity and frequency of related disasters. And this has led to an increased risk of displacement in the future. More people are forced to flee their homes because of floods, tropical storms, droughts, sea rise, and other natural hazards. Please, could you just uh, mute your microphone uh, if you're online? That would be great. Thank you. Oh, that might be your one. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Um, in 2020 alone, so these are figures from the IDMC, 30.7 you know, million people were displaced by disasters, constituting the highest annual number in a decade. So this is a, a problem that's here and it's increasing. Now, with this displacement, there are significant housing, land and property protection challenges that arise. The impacts of climate change, they worsen the situation and prospects for displacement affected people. They prevent durable solutions, they lack access to natural resources, restrict livelihoods and can exacerbate conflicts. So lots of things that are all linked together. Now, HLP rights, what are they? I'm trying to get away from using HLP as an acronym. So if anyone has a suggestion of what we could do instead of HLP for housing, land and property, I would love to hear it because yeah, it can create a barrier anyway. HLP rights, they're about having a home, they're about having a place that offers shelter, safety, the ability to secure a livelihood. And this home is free from the fear of forced eviction. So it's about how do we feel secure in a place? What's our connection to a place? How, do we, how are we able to live our lives in that place? Now, HLP can include the full spectrum of rights to housing, land and property. And these can be held according to statutory or customary law and also informally. HLP rights are held by owners, tenants, cooperative dwellers, customary land tenure owners and users, the informal sector dwellers, and those without secure tenure. Now these rights are intrinsically related to environmental rights as well. And this implies access to unspoiled natural resources that enable survival. This might be land, shelter, food, water, and air. And with the impacts of climate crisis on displaced people, there's significant additional HLP protection challenges. 
There might be an assumption in a disaster that people will go back to their homes once the hazard ends. And this might be the case, but in many situations, insecure HLP and natural resource rights are actually a barrier to that return being possible or to relocation or resettlement. In other cases, displaced people might settle in unsafe areas, attempting to sustain their livelihoods or their cultural connections to the land. The impacts of climate change and disasters may also render areas uninhabitable. Disaster displacement can become protracted when return is not possible. The measures to relocate or integrate displaced people are absent, or they fail to address the actual needs of IDPs or refugees. Housing, land and property considerations are also key for preparedness, prevention, response and recovery. For example, people living in informal settlements might face higher risks of displacement that's linked to poor housing conditions or environmentally vulnerable locations. They might also face high risks of not being able to return. So HLP rights are therefore central to improving planning to reduce these vulnerabilities. It's often wrongly assumed that the HLP rights of displaced people are better protected in disaster situations and that protection challenges are less prevalent than in conflict situations. This can lead to HLP issues being neglected in humanitarian development responses to disasters. In situations where both disasters and conflict are drivers of displacement, addressing HLP rights is essential to virtually all <coughs> forms of humanitarian programming. It might be building shelters, infrastructure, supporting sustainable livelihoods, also linked to demining activities, providing adequate water, sanitation and health programming. Anytime there's an interaction with land, we need to think about HLP rights. And when this is misunderstood or ignored by humanitarian actors, there can be serious protection concerns that emerge that can lead to further conflict, violence, dispossession and displacement. However, if we address these HLP issues in a clear, thoughtful, systematic way, we can actually prevent additional harm. We can improve trust within communities, we can enhance the capacity of governance institutions, and we can lead to sustainable solutions to displacement. NRC, NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council, and the HLPOR are working in partnership with the government of Liechtenstein to address the gap in knowledge of HLP protection challenges that relate to disaster and other displacement in the context of climate change. And that's why we're here today to discuss that. So thank you for your attention there. I just wanted to uh, situate our conversation and our discussion and we can see the speakers on the screen there. We're going to move on now to them. So I'm really pleased to uh, welcome uh, Nina Berkeland, who is our Senior Advisor on Disaster Displacement and Climate Change. And as, as a co-convener, Nina will also be jumping in with some comments throughout the session as well. And like I say, we want this to be, um, uh, yeah, have an element of informality that we can actually have you know, conversation and dialogue. So once we've heard from the speakers, we will then definitely be opening it up and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Nina, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim, and welcome to all. There's actually quite a few people in the room, and even more online. And I said, if you have more than 30 people, we should be very happy. And I think we're happy with our attendance. So we are competing with the high-level event at HSMTW on climate change. But as I said, we're on our first attendance this morning. I think people who want to listen go downstairs. People who want to think and discuss, they came here or are online with us. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, because we need you to be part of a discussion going forward, I'll send around a very fancy paper because some of you have registered online, but maybe not. So if you can put name and email and organization, then we'll be able to reach you after. So climate change, disaster displacement, housing and property. What I've been asked to do is to say a little bit of kind of what has happened and what's happening in the policy landscape, because all our interventions after we talk much more concretely on different regions and different uh, tools and, and how you actually do it in reality. But if you look on climate change and uh, displacement, I think it's fair to say that this has really been on the agenda for more than 10 years, quite systematically, and very much uh, coordination through the platform on disaster displacement that I think many of you know about, Start That Finance Initiative. And if you look to, for example, data and knowledge production, uh, IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which is a part of NRC, they released their first report back in 2009, covering disaster displacement up to 2008. So it's not new, but I think it's relatively new that they actually, as humanitarian organizations, are not just thinking about it, but actually trying to do something. I think also if you look at the program of uh, HMTW, you see there's a lot of efforts on greening. I don't think you find many events that talk about what are the impacts on people and what do we as 
humanitarian organizations need to do. So protection is one, but also others. So I really hope that this event will help us around that. Could you take the next slide there, right? So when we talk about the policy world, and of course we could have put up many more processes, but some of the bigger ones where we, with NRC, Platform Disaster Displacement, IM, UNHCR, GNDR, I mean, you could list many organizations where we've been trying to get the issue of displacement and disaster displacement into policies related to the climate change and disasters. We have, of course, the climate change negotiations. I put the logo of the Paris Agreement because I think that's really the when everyone started to realize it. And uh, in Paris at the COP21, we got a reference uh, to uh, not in the Paris Agreement, but in the next level of decisions to displacement. And it was also established a task force to work on the prevention uh, and response to displacement, which is completely new in the UNFCC system, the climate change negotiations. Also in 2015, we got the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. Those of you who know that, you'll see there's lots of references around migration, displacement, uh, people on the move. There's not one term, but there's many on, on people personally and uh, voluntary moving. And if you look at these two frameworks, I think on the Sendai framework, it's easier to move on practice because it's not a legal framework that is negotiated word by word. But I think if you look to the power and where the money comes, it's of course the climate change negotiation. So you need to at least both. If you look on the humanitarian migration displacement side, you have two compacts that also very much came out of 2015 with the New York Declaration that said you need to have two compacts on migration and for refugees. Back and forth, lots of negotiation, but when it comes to how climate change impacts migration and also disaster displacement, that very much ended up sitting in the global compact on migration. It is referred to climate in the Global Compact on Refugees, not climate change. This is politics. Guess which was the biggest donor to UNHCR in 2015. So it's in there, but it's not covered in the same way. So these are some examples. The last one I wanted to refer to is the platform on disaster displacement, which is a state-led process where we as uh, NGOs, UN organizations, academia, etc., are also working together. So you have a process that has been able Sorry, I'm speaking too fast. Um, so the platform on this path, the displacement, that is a process that was set up by states because back in 2011, everyone expected that the uh, disaster displacement would be picked up by the UN organizations, UNHCR, IAM, etc., especially UNHCR. It wasn't the space and it didn't happen. So then states came together. Uh, Switzerland and Norway made a pledge, we will lead a process on this. And later you have had other states coming on board on this. So it's uh, over the years been then co-chaired by first Switzerland, Norway, uh, Germany, Bangladesh, Fiji and France, and then the EU will take over from this summer. So this is ongoing. I will leave that, but I will just kind of show this is a big landscape. But I think what is one or a reason why we want to have this event to then look at the protection gaps is that it is relatively successful to get it in here. But neither Sendai nor the climate change negotiation is really about protection. Mm. So how do we get it more uh, acted on, on our side? And I think if you look to what has happened, HLP has actually been one of the few protection issues that has somehow seeped into this more, again, on the Sendai side than on the, than the climate change negotiation. But if you go to the next slide, please. Just as an example of the climate change negotiations, I think if you go back to the COP14 in 2008 in Copenhagen, I think that's maybe the first space where this was discussed a bit systematically. Uh, NRC re released a report of thoughts of refugees. We would never use a title like that today, but that was kind of the way you framed it from years ago. I mean, um, can we have the slide in the room? Thank you. I will not go through all the years, but basically you see every year since 2008, there has been something happening around displacement at uh, climate change negotiations. And as I said, in Paris, you got the task force. Uh, in uh, Glasgow last year, it wasn't really on the top level, but it kept being part of underlying decisions. So I think, again, how do we keep it on the agenda and how do we move it forward when we know, uh, go forward? I think we have a big opportunity because of loss and damage is finally becoming a priority for many around the climate change negotiations. Next slide. 
So the PDD. We started as the Nansen Initiative back in 2013. And then became the platform disaster displacement. I think this is the kind of policy space where we have been able to convene across many actors. So civil society, international organizations, UN, Red Cross, and not the least states. And it's having states at the table and leading it. I think we've been able to get quicker change than if it had been sitting purely on the kind of humanitarian system. But people might have different opinions on that. I wanted to highlight one document here, which is called the Agenda for Protection of Cross Border Displacement. Persons in the context of disasters and climate change. So that is a compilation of good practices on protection in the context of, of disasters and climate change. When you search it, you won't find too many references to health and land property. Excellent. March this year, the Global Protection Cluster launched uh, a guidance for team protection clusters and AORs, the uh, area of responsibilities for preparedness protection in the context of climate change and disasters. HLP is an AOR on the GPC. Search HLP in these two, nothing. If you search property, you will find one reference to property in the guidance on the GPV. And if you search the toolkit, you'll also find one reference. So I think it just shows that we have a need to push the HLP uh, issue up also on the protection cluster side where we are all part of. Next slide. On the, just as an example, on the disaster uh, risk reduction side, we, with as NRC, but also with many others, we have worked on trying to get disaster displacement acted on by policymakers and practitioners. So instead of coming with a guidance, this is disaster displacement, we try to help that to be integrated into national DRR policies and practice. We have some successful uh, examples. We have quite a bit of work in the motion, but it's slowly happening. Then one more slide and I will stop. This one, I don't know if it works on a small screen, but what I want to show here, if you focus on one of these dots, everything else will start to turn. And this is my point when we talk about displacement, housing, land and property and protection. You can't just look at one because it's all connected, but you still need to focus on the specific list to know how to move this uh, forward. So I would take that off to get, to get people to uh, this in the morning and uh, we will get back to policy and blah, blah, blah at the end. But I think now it's time to go to what's actually happening and not just what are the global frameworks, which we then need to make sure are implemented in the reality. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And uh, yeah, thank you for that optical illusion. But it makes a good point of trying to yeah focus in on specific things like we're doing today, but seeing them as connected to the the wider issues and I think our three speakers now who are uh, sort of joining us from that sort of field perspective um, that sort of practitioner perspective will really make that clear the linkages that are there and so yeah thank you Nina for um, sort of setting that in the context of some of the policy developments that are ongoing and um, pleased now to welcome uh, Hugo Reichenberger who's the Senior Protection Cluster Coordinator um, in Mozambique and um, with UNHCR. Um, Hugo are you there and are you ready? Yes, uh, I'm here and ready. Let me just project maybe my presentation, if that's okay with you. Yes. And tell me when I can uh, just uh, start. <laughs> just one second. Um, I see HLP and climate-induced displacement protection cluster Mozambique. Fantastic. Yes, please Fantastic. take it. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim and uh, Nina for your very interesting introduction um, and, and also thank you very much for inviting myself uh, uh, to participate. Um, as mentioned by Jim, I'm the National Protection Cluster Coordinator in Mozambique um, and HLP is one of the many different issues that we are looking at. Um, and what I, I guess my main message of my presentation is really that <clears throat> HLP within Mozambique um, has, is, is important for a number of factors, right? Mozambique, we, we have two, let's say, emergencies or two types of displacement happening at the moment. We have, of course, the conflict in the north. This is, of course, conflict-driven, human rights violations-driven, um, and many of many of the origin of that story of displacement has a beginning in HLP. Uh, rights violations, right? Um, about communities initially being displaced, um, essentially by large uh, companies coming in, encroaching on land, 
which has then fueled grievances and fueled uh, conflict and displacement. And then the second situation which we have is a continuous uh, yearly, um, let me call visits of cyclones, um, which are becoming more intense and more frequent in the central part of Mozambique. And the HLP element there is, is very important because as I will try to demonstrate, there's a very innovative uh, land law in Mozambique, but Mozambique becomes a little bit of a, a victim of this innovation as um, it, it becomes increasingly difficult for communities to secure land when they are displaced by a cyclone. So um, welcome to Mozambique, um, where I'm speaking from. We are essentially in a, a very uh, a, a poor country, right? Um, very low rank in, in HDHDI. Um, <coughs> and of course, what I'd like to stre um, stress, a very long country, right? So I'm based in Maputo in the extreme south, and my many of my colleagues in fact, my other cluster coordinator is in Cabo Delgado in the north, 2,300 kilometers away. So we are talking about a very, about a very, very long uh, country and very much exposed to climate change, um, to, to cyclones and not, um, not prepared at, at all to deal with these uh, challenges. It ranks 154th in the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative that looks at vulnerability and readiness of countries. Uh, this, this map, and, and, and people frequently ask me, but wait a second, you're in Africa, you're in Mozambique, um, are there cyclones, um, are there cyclones in Africa? So I like to show this um, map from the World Bank, which tracks since 1969, the different cyclones um, hitting Mozambique. Um, it looks like a child has just drawn onto this map, but in fact, it's a different cyclones hitting Mozambique since 1969. Um, and we as a humanitarian community, <clears throat> and within this humanitarian community uh, protection cluster has been dealing with more higher intense and frequent cyclones since uh, since the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, before 2000s, the last cyclones had been, you know, 20 years ago, pretty much. And since 2007, they've become more and more frequent. And now we're really looking at a situation where we have cyclones and displacement, right, which is an important link to HLP happening really on a yearly basis. Um, and of course, I think you've all heard of Idai. This was an infamous a largest cyclone in African history in 2019, uh, displacing, displacing 400,000 people, to which I will speak to uh, a lot in my examples. Um, let me jump to this photo that I took myself in an evacuation center after Cyclone Eloise. Um, that's another thing about the cyclones in Mozambique. They all have very beautiful names, but unfortunately they have devastating impacts. Um, what struck me in these evacuation centers is that, of course, people are drying their clothes, most obviously, right? But what they're also drying is um, civil documentation, and among them, their famous duat, which is their land tenureship document within uh, Mozambican law, which they lay out to dry um, after cyclone hits, because they full well understand the importance of this documentation, right? We are, we are in a in a in a in, in a country that has a very strong social presence, very strong presence of a a, a very strong bureaucratic presence throughout its territory. Oh, somebody is unmuted and speaking Portuguese. Um, Okay, it's it's gone. Yeah, okay. Sorry, <clears throat> no, no, Hugo's <laughs> I think you're muted, Hugo. If you could just unmute. My apologies. Um, I can. You can hear me now. Yes, we hear you well. Um, 
<laughs> okay. So one one interesting elements that I want to to maybe share with with uh, you colleagues, uh, specialist experts on HLP. I consider myself more of a generalist in protection. Is that there's essentially a very interesting land law in Mozambique that has been quoted as known as the best land law in Africa. Uh, this for a number of reasons um, because it. It, it, it was it came out of the need to have a flexible land law um, in a country that has been ravaged by civil war for the last decades, right? With refugees returning in the 90s, IDPs going back to their lands, people that had never been displaced, and a lot of conflict happening um, as a result of the former rigid land law that existed. So they created a very flexible, innovative land law that recognizes customary law and um, is meant to protect com communities, recognize gender equality. Um, ladies and gentlemen, a very beautiful law on paper, um, however, unfortunately, with a number of, of, of challenges. Um, maybe what I should stress here is that it, it ironically, right, it, it, it was created as a response to the internal displacement in the country. However, as internal displacement continues in this uh, in the country, there's still challenges in implementing that law. The basic tenets of the law is that law cannot be uh, sold and law belongs to the state, right? We are still, um, Mozambique was part of the Soviet uh, sphere, uh, right, in the Cold War and has inherited this revolutionary post-Soviet style of, of governance, um, land being very much uh, owned by the state, and individuals come and they can acquire the rights to use the law through the duat, right? This document that the gentleman is, is demonstrating there, um, and with very flexible and community-based mechanisms to have that land uh, usage or recognized to oneself. Land cannot be sold. That's another element of the law. However, there are a number of challenges <coughs> with this law. Um, because uh, because land cannot be sold, but, um, but however, it is still sold anyways, right? There's still a number of informal processes that have come together to bridge that gap um, in many ways. And people are still very much I'm in a position where they have to buy uh, a land um, and it's also very costly to register oneself within the duat and so very very few uh, people actually do so only 10 percent and we'll show you more data below another element is that the wish to make a, la a land law that is overly based on a community consent um, has actually uh, um, has created a situation in which the the details of having that community consent realized has not yet been codified by law, causing some confusion um, and some lack of transparency how to actually acquire land. Um, this is a um, the result of a, an assessment that was done across the territory by the National Peasantry Union, um, a very uh, strong um, civil society actor in Mozambique. And as you can see in the south there, 67% of people don't have uh, duats. In the, in the center, 70%. In the north, 81%. Um, so very few actually register uh, their duat. Curiously enough, and this is part of the, the flexibility of the duat. You're not required to actually necessarily register your duat. Um, if you have enough um, evidence in, within the community at the local level that you have been using the land for th the last couple of years, you are entitled to duat to, to, to work it. But of course, um, without having that registered in a situation of displacement caused by cyclones, this complicates uh, this law. So again, a law created to facilitate access to land as a result of displacement, then is creates additional problems when there are continuous displacement. I guess that's my key message 
uh, for you today. Another element of it is gender inequality, and I will not read these boring facts to you. I will just go straight to the fact that within the same assessment done by the National Peasantry Union, as you can see, the red color there are the duat registered <laughs> for women. Unfortunately, as you can see, for south, center and north, there are no red um, bar graphs there, so no women have actually um, or very few have registered uh, duat. Another thing um, maybe that I want to highlight is um, civil documentation. Then um, the lack of his civil documentation is another a challenge um, in an assessment that we did as a protection cluster. Only 45% of IDPs um, had their civil documentation. And of course, this is a first step to acquiring uh, the DUAT, which is, again, if you want to formalize it, if you want to um, have that documentation, it's a very complicated and laborious process. But already the fact of not having a civil documentation to start with already um, exposes displaced persons by cyclone and conflict to a number of protection issues, thus reducing the chance that they will acquire civil documentation and then move over to then acquire another document through a very lengthy bureaucratic process. You guys um, just yes, yes, please. Over to you, um, Jim. I heard you coming in there. I'm almost finished. You can have one more, another minute or so. That's fine. I was just uh, telling you. OK, fantastic. No, no, just, just very quickly, I guess um, there was an assessment done after he died, um, and it showed that 90% of the displaced did not have their duat's previous displacement. 82% um, of IDPs that were relocated had no duat allocated, only 14%. Um, had those duats, but I want to move very quickly to my recommendations, right? In protection, we think of responsive remedial and um, environment building in our egg model. In the responsive, I've, I really want to make a case that um, duat is important, uh, right? HLP is important in this context. There needs to be strengthening of HLP AOR coordination. In Mozambique, right, we had an HLP coordinator last year. Unfortunately, um, we had to leave. We wish to go back to that provision of civil documentation as a responsive mechanism to continue, including the DUAT as well. And for DUAT to be considered when um, considering, for example, the allocation or relocation sites. And then a number of ideas that I will not go into details, but of course, raise the awareness of the rights of communities within the 1997 land law that I've been mentioning, um, and that do what be automatically provided when with land plots when IDPs are relocated. Environment building, there are a number of them there, but maybe what I, what I, will, um, what I will stress is that there is a very interesting law. It just needs to be um, um, a way, it just needs to be prioritized within humanitarian development response following cyclones. Um, and therefore, of course, the interest of donors has to be there and to understand this better. And for this, we really need capacity on the ground to unpack this complex law and see ways in which to um, write, translate it more um, practically within our context. So I will leave it at that, uh, dear Jim, with my minute being up. Thank you so much, Hugo. And um, yeah, we can come back to you with some questions. <coughs> but thanks for also not only setting out the challenge and the, the, the connections with, um, uh, you know, between that displacement related to the cyclones, but also in the context of uh, ongoing conflict in the north as well, uh, facing lots of different uh, challenges as they all come together. That the response of which can be undermined by the, the situation regarding land and people's uh, connection to it. So thanks for setting that out and for being clear on some recommendations. Um, I know I've got some work to do in that as well, so thank you for highlighting that. Um, that's good to, good to see. I'm really pleased now to turn to um, colleagues uh, in Somalia. So we have uh, Evelyn Ero Magero, who is the Acting HLPOR Coordinator in Somalia and the Regional Advisor for the NRC's Information Counseling and Legal Assistance Programme. 
and also Shizan Kirubi, who's the uh, Information Counseling and Legal Assistance Specialist in Somalia. So over to you, Evelyn and uh, Shizan, to share about um, yeah, your experiences working in Somalia in response to some of these challenges and some of the things that you've been able to do in that response. Evelyn, over to you. And we're going to, sh yeah, we're going to share your, your presentation, so just one moment. Thank you, Jim. Just to mention that Shazan is unable to join due to conflicting priorities. I'll be presenting uh, jointly for Somalia. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, this presentation is really developed uh, together with the HLP area of responsibility. So most of the work that we've been doing around this was generated through the work that our partners have been doing on the ground. So looking at the impact of climate change on securing HLP rights, security of tenure is what has emerged mostly in our work around uh, climate change uh, and uh, climate induced displacement and HLP rights. So one of the things that we have identified is the fact that it does exacerbate the complexity of HLP rights. So as mentioned by the previous presenter, there is a lot of loss of tenure documents and damage to boundaries, and this has implications post displacement for tenure security. So during an emergency, there is usually a focus on, on life saving interventions. So from an HLP uh, point of view, sometimes we are so focused on responding to HLP needs within the emergency. So as a result, we tend to uh, focus on securing tenure for emergency relief, say temporary shelters or temporary water points uh, in response to say drought induced displacement. And I'll give you a, an example of a case study on Baidoa. Baidoa is one of the districts in, in Somalia in a region called Bai. And uh, in the recent drought uh, response, Drought-induced displacement affected a significant number of the displaced people, but also new dis contributed to new displacements. And as we were providing support to the drought displaced in urban centers, what emerged was the fact that the, pa the persons that were actually providing HLP due diligence and land tenure security support to asked us to actually uh, loc locate, relocate them closer to their areas of display to, the, to their villages of origin. So if there's an urban center, the preference was to be relocated closer to the area of origin. So if you're from a rural area, the urban center that is closest to the rural area. And the reason was that they also wanted us to provide land tenure security support for HLP issues that they anticipated would emerge post the drought. And, and that is a, a clear reflection that sometimes we focus so much on the response within the emergency, but sometimes we need to also take uh, preventive action. And that, that is a clear indication that we actually do see the linkages between climate uh, change, uh, climate induced displacement, and also HLP rights, both in the place of displacement and the, in the villages of origin. We also have identified that uh, it's a, an effect multiplier which increases the risks of HLP violations. It multiplies the probability and intensity of extreme weather events and environmental hazards rather than directly creating them. Meaning that if there were already risks associated with HLP violations, say inadequate housing, the fact that there is there are issues around flooding or drought and even famine, that exacerbates the HLP issues that these displaced populations were facing. And also, we've also seen in Somalia that it contributes, it is actually escalates land grabs. There are a lot of land grabs, but also we've seen a new emerging issue of where there's drought displacement or displacement population movements linked to famine or even floods. We've seen that some powerful um, businessmen and even sometimes authorities actually that are left behind to protect the rights of these displaced persons or, you know, to, or of host, vulnerable host community actually participate in land grabs and they take advantage of the climate-induced displacement that leaves these villages nearly empty. Next slide. And uh, linked to the to the land grabs, we've also seen the politicization of land issues. So the politics are around land in Somalia has also been amplified in the recent years, and this has also created different trajectories of 
property rights, values and relations, and therefore uh, addressing it from a preventive uh, perspective is really key. Looking at tenure documentation, looking at defining boundaries as a preventive measure and looking at uh, defining those boundaries, say, in flood prone areas, because, you know, the temporary boundaries that are not well demarcated can be washed away during a flooding. We've also seen implications for gender. We know that in Somalia, uh, women, especially the impacts of climate change affect women and men differently, but women are often responsible for producing uh, food or, or gathering uh, and also fetching water. And this has implications for HLP because some of these, most of these resources are actually based on some form of HLP. And in, in, in the long term, we, when, when climate induced displacements take place, women are disproportionately affected. Next slide. So what have we been doing? And as I mentioned earlier, yes, the HLP area of responsibility is called led by the Norwegian Refugee Council in Somalia. But these are some of the key aspects that are outside the traditional HLP response that we have been able to implement as a result of the emerging climate induced displacement, but also the need for HLP to be part and parcel of, of, of these kinds of uh, responses and interventions. We've one, the first thing we've done, we have conducted an analysis to inform programming and policy. So uh, in 2018, due to the floods in Somalia, we undertook a study on the flood assess, a flood assessment uh, in Belatwain. Belatwain is um, often affected by floods. And <coughs> And this was uh, led by Northern Frontier Youth League, a local partner that is part of the HLP era. And uh, this, uh, one of the key recommendations uh, from this assessment was that we lack the tools as the housing, land and property area of responsibility to actually respond to HLP issues that are linked to some of these um, uh, climate change aspects. So like uh, HLP issues during a flood, HLP during a drought, and this resulted into the second response, which was the development of a, of a resource park. And this resource park is a toolkit that is supported by the global HLP area of responsibility, together with the HLP area of responsibility in Somalia. We have developed a toolkit that has two parts. The first part lists about 11 tools uh, that can be used by any HLP actor in identifying HLP needs prior to a natural disaster, and then also to be able to respond during the disaster and post the disaster. Then the second part of the toolkit is a manual, and uh, the manual is a training of trainers manual. So this manual includes uh, five training modules, and one of the training modules is actually a module on climate change and land rights. And we're very specific and intentional about climate change and land rights, because that is where we saw the most evidence, and also that's where we saw the most need. And uh, this um, takes us, of course, to the to the training itself. So you will see that the third response is training. This has not yet taken place because the toolkit has not yet been uh, piloted, but we hope that uh, this training will empower HLP actors to contextualize trainings that are very specific to natural disasters within the context of housing, land and property. The third is advocacy. The analysis uh, that I've mentioned above includes uh, policy briefs. So recently, the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility also produced a policy brief on drought and housing, land and property in Mogadishu. And uh, this, uh, these, these analyses have informed advocacy. So we've been able to generate evidence and use this evidence to influence programming and policy work, and also to remind humanitarian actors that HLP is relevant during um, such responses, and also that they need to make sure that HLP is mainstreamed within their interventions. We have be, we have received more traction with the Durable Solutions Secretariat in Somalia, and so we've been able to, to actually champion this more through the Durable Solutions Framework in Somalia. The last one is to facilitate security of land tenure. As you will have seen from the earlier example I gave you from Baidoa, we have been able to map HLP issues and concerns in drought, and we are now moving that land. We are actually using that learning to start to map H potential <coughs> HLP issues uh, with the framing that is being declared uh, in Somalia. So this is very preventive. It enables us to 
understand the tenure issues, the nature of the challenges to securing tenure, the nature of the tenure arrangement, and make sure we also have hybrid. So sometimes documenting the arrangements and not usually focusing so much on the documents, but to, uh, focusing on using existing mechanisms of securing tenure in such locations. Because when you're looking at climate change, it's not just limited to the areas that are accessible when we are responding through our humanitarian interventions. It also includes peri-urban and rural areas. Next slide, please. But of course, as we try to look at climate change and uh, HLP or climate induced displacements that are linked to and their implications for housing, land and property rights, there are some challenges that we have uh, identified. There are many, but we'll just highlight some of the ones that we thought are more relevant uh, for this session. So one of them is limited inf information. Uh, as you will have realized that when Jim mentioned, uh, spoke about HLP and finding an acronym, when you talk about it within the pers perspective of HLP, you will find that it's very difficult to unpack the H, the L, and the P. But you'll find uh, some information around land rights and climate change, but that is sometimes very much um, linked to development aspects. When you look at the humanitarian perspective, there is limited information on HLP and climate change. And we're not saying that we want to limit it to humanitarian interventions, no. We think that from our humanitarian work that evidence can also be able to influence the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Some work has been done around land rights and climate change, but we need a broader perspective that covers the entire framework of housing, land and property. The other is the weak policy environment. Both normative and institutional frameworks in Somalia are generally weak. Moreover, laws and policies are still repugnant. So even it's very, it's usually um, good to, to drive some of these um, messages through policy, influence of policy work. But where policies are repugnant or policies do not even exist or they are weak, it makes the work more difficult and complicated. The other is capacity gaps. Generally, there is limited understanding on the relationship between land rights and climate change within the humanitarian sector. Uh, so sometimes even within a drought response, if you're an HLP actor or within a famine response, they will ask you, why is HLP relevant? Take it out. So that already shows you that there's limited understanding. So limited that they, there's even um, no understanding that some of these interventions like shelter, wash, or nutritional centers are actually uh, constructed on HLP, on some form of HLP. Uh, so then there's also preference for life-saving interventions. HLP is seldom considered a priority. I think I've mentioned that. And more displacements attributed to climate change focus more on those life-saving interventions that I have mentioned. Next slide. So we have also identified some gaps and areas of future investment. You'll see that some of the gaps are linked to the challenges, but we think that we should support the establishment of normative and institutional frameworks, uh, including post-disaster policies in Somalia. That may be, they may be standalone policies, but we, we may also embed them in land reform, land policy or land law reform. Prevention and preparedness, we could focus on prevention and preparedness, integrating HLP responses in early action activities and mobilizing resources for HLP and climate change. The other is capacity development. I think I have mentioned uh, uh, development of tools that we've started, but facilitate, facilitating trainings, providing material support to relevant institutions and departments, and also providing technical assistance whether we second or support with fact finding, that will be important in developing the capacity of authorities or uh, actors that are working on land rights uh, to consider climate change issues. And then lastly, address issues around data and evidence, address issues around HLP and climate change that are complex, costly, and have long-term implications. It's therefore vital for interventions to be based on evidence uh, that is available. So beyond just analysis and research, maybe having a, in, aspirational studies or longitudinal studies that revisits these issues because some of them are recurrent. That's the end, Jim. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. Thanks so much for that. And um, yeah, really interesting to hear that perspective and some of the things you're doing in response. And just worth noting that the, the toolkit and that those models that are being developed are 
uh, something that we'll look to um, sort of share more widely. And if that's something that's of interest to you where you're working in your context, then please do get in touch. We'll share the details about that later on. And um, it's something we want to be available to adapt and to, and to develop further. Um, thank you. So many interesting things in there that we can uh, pick up uh, uh, later on. And um, particularly that preference for life-saving intervention, which is something that comes up a lot when we're talking about housing, land and property issues and, and, and you know, how important or not are they seen to be. So I think that's uh, something that's relevant for a lot of different contexts. So thank you for, for highlighting that as well. Um, now I'm really pleased to turn to uh, uh, Daniel Fitzpatrick from the Faculty of Law at Monash University, who's going to give us uh, a perspective focused on uh, the Pacific region. So uh, Daniel, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, could could uh, Ryan share my slides? Brilliant. I think they're shared now. There we go. Thanks, Daniel. All right. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, next slide, thanks. So, what I want to emphasise with the Pacific is that we we have a similar situation of legal pluralism as um, as uh, Hugo described for uh, Mozambique. So we have customary land, and we also have uh, what's called alienated land. And alienated land is uh, state land, but it's also land held under statutory rights. Um, and so what that means is that we have different types of movement of people in the Pacific. Uh, when we use a HLP lens, that is, there's movement within the customary territory of a group, and that's generally small-scale movement. It's often because of rising sea levels. Uh, you have movement to the customary territory of another group, um, and that includes movement to uh, peri-urban settlements, which is a which is a big issue in the Pacific. And then you have movement to alienated land, which is generally uh, statutory land. Um, next slide. So legal pluralism, um, and this slide here, it doesn't come out uh, very well at all, but it, uh, it shows the extent of customary land in the Pacific. And the important thing about the Pacific, like Mozambique, is that there is legal recognition of customary land. So it's a category uh, of, of, of legal ownership. Uh, next slide. So this is the uh, Solomon Islands in the Pacific. And it just illustrates my point about um, uh, legal pluralism. So the, the areas marked in green are legally recognised as customary land. Um, and the areas marked in red and yellow are combinations of state land and privately held alienated land. Okay. Now, in Solomon Islands, it, it, it also shows another key point that I want to make is that yeah, there's the the issues of rapid onset disaster displacement are similar to what Hugo and Evelyn described, particularly um, Evelyn's description. We have an interaction of rapid onset natural disasters and slow onset disasters. So climate change is acting as a threat multiplier. We have problems with introducing HLP assessments early into humanitarian activities after a rapid onset disaster. Um, there, there are particular problems with displacement onto the country <laughs> land of another group, right? And so you, what happens is you get protracted displacement and conflict with the host community. Um, there are also problems with uh, people who, do, who are displaced moving, self-settling. Um, so the, the government wants them to to relocate to another area or to settle in another area, but they move to, to the area that they prefer. And that also is a, is a common phenomenon. Um, there is less of a problem with civil documents um, for reasons that I can, uh, that I can talk about. But, but the general point is that with rapid onset disaster displacement, we have similar HLP issues that have both Evelyn and Hugo described. However, for this presentation, I want to focus on uh, slow onset natural disasters, that is particularly rising sea levels, which is, um, which apart from cyclones, obviously, is a major issue in the Pacific, is the rising sea level problem. Um, could I get the next slide? Thanks. So 
moving, moving away from rap, no, uh, back one, please. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, go next slide. Stop next slide. Yep. So moving away from rapid onset natural disasters and looking at rising for sea levels and slow onset, um, what we have in the Pacific, um, in addition to the humanitarian frameworks for rapid onset natural disasters, we have an emerging set of policies relating to planned relocation. And, and that is particularly focused on rising sea levels. So it's a, it's a much slower process. Um, there are now numerous villages that in the Pacific, coastal villages that have, that have moved under planned relocation guidelines, especially in Fiji and Vanuatu, which have, um, which have had sets of guidelines for a number of years now. There is a, a guidelines being drafted in Solomon Islands at the moment. Now, one of the issues with planned relocation is illustrated by, by this case of Wallande Island. And you can see, the, uh, it's a complicated case, but just, just to put it simply, you can see the effect of um, rising sea levels there, is that this, this community uh, moved to the land of another customary group uh, close to where this photo was taken. And that required an agreement with the customary landowners. Um, and so that's the first issue that I want to highlight with planned relocation is that if, if you can move within your customary territory, then that is a, the best result um, from an HLP perspective. But for an island like this, they, they had no more customary territory. They had to move to the mainland, to the to customary territory of another group. Um, and this was an agreement issue. Uh, next slide. The second type of uh, consequence of rising sea levels that I want to highlight is adaptive migration. So in this case, this is a well-known atoll to the north of the Solomon Islands. It's, it's very remote um, and you could see its vulnerability to rising sea levels. Now, most of the population of this, this atoll, if I could get the next slide, thanks. Uh, or I should say many, many people from these. <laughs> it, there tends to be circular processes of, of adaptive migration. So um, there is an informal settlement in the capital city, which is marked with that uh, on the map there, which is, which <laughs> is associated with people from Ontong Java. So this, this also is a common phenomenon, right, is that, is that when people move, move as a result of rising sea levels, it's it's not often rapid onset disaster displacement, although that 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 is a problem, right? Um, and it's not also often planned relocation through the governments because the governments lack resources and people move before um, the relocation takes place. So it tends to be the younger people, people looking for jobs, education. They move to the cities, but they move to an informal settlement that is connected to their home island settlement. Right. And this is what we have here. Uh, and this is an important point about HLP rights for um, rising sea levels, is we have to take into account migration to urban informal settlements. And the, in terms of numbers, this is the biggest issue in the Pacific when it comes to human mobility, um, in, my, in my view. Um, next slide. Now, this is a slide that shows the increasing number of uh, informal settlements in the urban area in, in Solomon Islands. Um, everyone would be familiar with this phenomenon from their own work, right? Uh, and I think this is tightly connected to the problem of rising sea levels, slow onset natural disasters and HLP issues. Next slide. So what I'm talking about, therefore, is extending the frame of HLP analysis beyond rapid onset disaster displacement to issues of planned relocation and adaptive migration. Um, now, as part of a, a policy report I did for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, which is coming out very soon, uh, I did a review of policy instruments in this area, uh, disaster risk management, climate adaptation plans, relocation and, and displacement guidelines. Um, and there were very few references that there were basically no references to HLP rights. And this is, this is consistent with, uh, with what Hugo was saying as well. 
Um, uh, there are some references to land tenure, but 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 very few. Um, and and so the problem of incorporating HLP into humanitarian policies extends to climate adaptation policies and disaster risk management policies generally. And that includes this emerging set of policies about uh, uh, planned relocation. Now, I should say that in Fiji, which was one of the first to introduce relocation guidelines, they're very aware of this issue and they are now working on introducing uh, land tenure analysis early on into the planned relocation process. Uh, next slide. Um, in the policy paper I did write, I, I set out a number of uh, uh, recommendations. I won't go through them in detail because of the time, um, but, the, but I just want to highlight um, two points. One is that, that there are cultural, pro when you get this situation of customary land, there are cultural processes for human mobility that we have to build on, right? That there are customary mechanisms for managing the movement of people that, that, that go way back, way, way back. And these include processes of um, gift exchange, of um, intermarriage, uh, you know, connections built over trade and, and, and trade networks over a long period of time. And these need to be incorporated into policy when, you, when you're dealing with customary land. Um, so the preference needs to be small scale movement of people, movement of people within uh, established cultural networks. Um, the, the second main issue I want to highlight is that, uh, is that the, the, a real problem that in, in this space is peri-urban settlements. Um, they are growing rapidly as we saw, and that these areas, the tenure rights, that is the HLP rights of, of those who live in these areas generally is not recorded, right? Um, and so when it comes to disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management, we, 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 we don't know who, who is living where. Um, and um, uh, this also would be a familiar problem. And it extends not just to, to a rapid onset displacement, but it's also a problem when we talk about uh, adaptive migration and, and planned relocation. Uh, next slide. Um, and then a, a number of policy recommendations for uh, alienated land. Um, I, again, I, I won't go through these in, in detail in the interest of time. Uh, I just want to note the last point, though, is that what we do have in the policy instruments is an emerging set of references to uh, geospatial data. So um, these are data platforms to predict extreme weather, uh, to predict the impacts of, of disasters. It, all those people who work in the humanitarian area are familiar with these uh, spatial products. Um, and, and a lot of work is being done in this area uh, in terms of climate change. But the missing link is tenure and HLP rights, is that, that the, this, this technical concern with data is not linking up with uh, the records of people who are living, particularly in peri-urban uh, settlements. And I, I see this as a, a major future focus of, of policy, um, policy work. Um, and the last slide. So then just to broaden out the lens, and, and as the, my main point is that, um, is that climate change is in, introducing a new set of a HLP challenges. We're, we're, we're all familiar with a focus on restitution as a response to displacement. You know, people should be allowed to go home and that creates a, a durable solution or, or the opportunity for a durable solution. But when it comes to climate change and things like rising sea levels, people can't go home, as we saw from um, some, some of those slides. And so we need to adopt a broader focus that, that draws on a protection toolkit, um, depending on the type of movement and depending on the type of land that, uh, that to which people are moving. Um, and that requires that all types of emerging policy instruments relating to climate change uh, and human mobility, displacement, relocation and migration uh, include an HLP lens, right? And um, third point is that I've made, you know, I really think there needs to be a focus on informal settlements. Um, and the last point in terms of in, in, in Indigenous peoples, um, and this relates particularly to planned relocation, the, the need to link HLP standards with uh, ILO 169 standards on in treatment of Indigenous peoples 
particularly uh, free prior and informed consent for, for planned relocation. Uh, so I'd be happy to talk about that more. And then I'll just, just go to the last slide, thanks. Um, just a couple of references there. Uh, the, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat paper will be um, coming out very shortly. Uh, the, the, in terms of humanitarian uh, activity and incorporating HLP rights into post-disaster, rapid onset disaster processes, uh, there's, there's the UN Habitat publication from 2010 that I was the primary author of. Uh, I still think that there's a, a lot in there that, that, is, that is useful. Uh, and the last one is um, uh, that, uh, something on disaster risk management that I've, I've been doing with the World Bank. Uh, and I'd be happy to share any of those documents with anyone who's interested. So thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. And we'll we'll share the the titles of those references in the chat just uh, just now as well, so that people can uh, yes. uh, look for them and find them. Um, and yeah, maybe if if you or any of the other speakers are willing to share your um, contact details, that might be helpful for people to get in touch. I'm really pleased now to hand over to uh, 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 Jamal Brown, who's uh, the Durable Solutions Officer with a real focus on housing land and property. Uh, for uh, UNHCR and their division of resilience and solutions. And Jamal is uh, a focal point on HLP for HCR. So it's great to have him here and he's going to offer some uh, reflections uh, on, on what we've heard so far. Jamal, over to you. Yes, good, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, for those of you um, currently in a time zone after midday, but of course, thank you very much, Jim. Um, for this opportunity. Um, congratulations on, on putting this session together. But of course, I'll also like to thank the other presenters, um, um, Nina, Hugo, Evelyn, Daniel, for these really enlightening presentations, if I must say. It's always important for us to ground any conversation that we have in, in operational context. And I think the, the, the knowledge, the information that has been shared today is absolutely critical and immensely relevant um, um, to the conversation. So I, I am truly grateful um, that you were able to share your perspectives today. I think it's really difficult um, to know in practical even for us to have a conversation on disaster risk reduction or, or climate change adaptation without prioritizing housing, land and property rights in a very broad context. And, and more specifically, tenure security. As, as Jim would have rightly indicated, you know, when we speak of HLP rights, we speak of, you know, the right to adequate housing, the protection of property, we speak of the peaceful enjoyment of possessions, we speak of non-interference with one's dwelling, et cetera. But if we're to look at, at, at all of these considerations, there is one thing that really comes to mind, and that is the extent to which HLP rights um, used interchangeably here with the concept of tenure security in its broader sense, um, HLP rights to a large extent underpin the international standards of human rights law. And I think that within itself is quite instructive. Um, very importantly as well, in, in Jim's presentation, he would have spoken to, to the fact that, you know, in an effort to address HLP rights, um, it's really important for us to look at it from different angles, um, operationally and otherwise. So it's important for us to look at humanitarian programming. It's important for us to look at, um, at disaster risk reduction, but it's also important for us to look at, at durable solutions. And, and each of these oper exists at different operational levels. So of course we have the humanitarian programming side of things, but then we have the development side of things, which is, which, which is typically captured by, for example, durable solutions, complementary pathways. And of course, in this, in this um, context, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. It's, it's, it would be remiss of any of us. And I think based on the presentations that we've, see, that we've heard today, there is an inextricable linkage really between HLP rights or tenure security, however we may wish to coin it, and, and, and vulnerability, um, vulnerability to natural hazards, vulnerability to, to climate change impact. So I don't think there's a need for me to really reiterate what those linkages are, considering that our colleagues would have already spoken to those today. But from an operational standpoint, I think it's important for us to, to look at tenure um, from two standpoints. And on one hand, we have the concept of resilience. 
and, and the role that tenure security plays in building resilience. And then on the other hand, we have the role that tenure security plays in, in, in self-reliance. And of course, that's from that's largely from a, a livelihood perspective. Of course, we know that tenure security is also important in the context of promoting dignity, safety, security, peace, etc. But I would like us to really zoom in on the context on the concept of, of resilience here, because a lot of our colleagues, a lot of the presentations today would have in some way or another spoken to this concept and, and, and the importance of, of resilience in, for example, promoting freedom of movement in the context of displacement, you know, gender equality. Some of our colleagues would have also spoken here today about um, about women's land rights, which I think is a, is a very important consideration that is often overlooked in many in many operational contexts. Of course, we have political participation, health, food, et cetera, work, and so on. Um, so it's really important for us to look at it from that standpoint when we speak of operationalizing um, tenure security. How do we really work towards solutions in the context of HRP rights and tenure security? Of course, the reality on the ground, as, our, as the presenters would have rightly pointed to, is that when we speak of tenure security, the reality is that there, there, there are many different types of tenure arrangements. You have communal land tenure arrangements, you have customary land tenure arrangements, you have various forms of tenancies, occupancies, etc. And then, of course, you have the statutory mechanisms that, that typify freehold tenure. But the reality in many of the operational contexts, particularly in the developing world and those those um, regions that are exposed to hydrometeorological hazards, et cetera, the reality is that there, there are what, what would typically be, be deemed as unfavorable land tenure arrangements that pose significant challenges to, to durable solutions and disaster risk reduction and, and complementary pathways and, 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 and climate change adaptation. So in that context, it's really important for us to really be able to address the challenges um, associated with, with, with tenure security. Um, your colleagues are hearing me, right? Yes, we hear you, Jamal, yes. Okay, very good. My apologies. So, <coughs> so in, in closing, um, one of the, the points that really stood out to me in, in the context of really being able to identify solutions, because, you know, I think it's really important for us at this point in time, because these conversations have been going on for a very long time. But I think at this point in time, it's really important for us to be absolutely laser focused on solutions laser focus on solutions, identifying the solutions to the challenges that we face where, where tenure security is concerned, where HLP rights in a very broad context is concerned. And I was, I was very happy, you know, to hear that um, quite a number of the, pr the pr presentations today alluded to this, that the fact that there are significant barriers to the improvement of tenure security, or what you may say, barriers to tenure mobility. Uh, many of the colleagues spoke about challenges with regards to global normative frameworks, guidelines, some of which are legally binding, others are perhaps not necessarily legally binding. But the fact in many instances, HLP rights and tenure security are perhaps not elaborated in the way that we would like them to be elaborated or in a way that would really justify or support the operationalization of HLP solutions in country operations. And I think that's a very important consideration. Of course, colleagues would have also spoken to policy related challenges legislative challenges, legal regulatory challenges, institutional challenges, um, and some of the, the macro forces, et cetera, that, and, and, and dynamic pressures that come with those. Um, so it's really important for us to understand and frame very clearly what are the challenges that we face as it pertains to HLP rights and tenure security, and to really be laser focused on addressing those issues around the concept of tenure mobility, those barriers to the improvement of, of tenure security. So I'll just leave it there for now, um, and I'll just hand back over the floor to Jim. And of course, um, I'm really looking forward to, to the next 10 minutes of conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamal. That's great. Thank you. Yes, um, so um, we're going to turn to some questions. We had a couple of questions coming online, so we'll go there first, and then we'll um, ask around the room. And again, online, if you want to submit questions in the chat or through the form, then please do so. Um, I want to invite um, Richards, who um, 
uh, commented, to, he's the UN humanitarian advisor in Papua New Guinea. Richard, would you like to <coughs> take the floor and uh, uh, either ask your question or, or make your, your point? <coughs> Hi, uh, good uh, evening from Papua New Guinea. Um, actually, my my comments were were uh, premature to to Daniel's presentation. He he very uh, succinctly and and comprehensively covered the the issues. Um, he, my my comment was is I, I felt like that that um, there's a, a dearth of, of expertise in this area in at least in Papua New Guinea and perhaps more broadly in the region in the Pacific region. Um, and I was just interested in understanding what, um, who else is in this space, and and maybe what resources um, would be available um, to help us uh, address that, particularly in the in the context that Daniel uh, very um, clearly defined in terms of slow onset um, events like uh, sea level rise. Over. Right. Thank you, Richard. And I think um, yeah, your comment in the chat and uh, and certainly uh, Daniel's presentation. It really makes clear these links between the slow onset and the thinking in that sort of development framing of, of these issues, as well as that humanitarian response for a, um, a, an early onset, quick onset uh, disaster. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. And we can let's follow up afterwards as well and talk more, more on these issues. Um, there was a question right at the beginning um, from uh, Louise. Are you still online, Louise? And if you are, would you like to ask your question? And if not, I will uh, I will pose it to the room and we can see. So I think this was for you, Nina, but it was around um, funding mechanisms uh, being available for humanitarian agencies to implement the different policies that you outlined. Um, I don't know if you have any response to that or if that's maybe a, a, a good question that points to a need for some advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't have the answer to it, but I can say a few things because there has been done some mapping and I can't remember the name of the German organization, but they published a couple of weeks back a mapping on how to access uh, climate funding from a humanitarian perspective. I'll find it after and I can share, yeah, yeah. I can share the summary of this. So, I mean, that's there. I think when we look at this, there's many things at play, but if you look on the bigger funding streams, we see that year after year, the humanitarian funding is getting lower and lower compared to the needs. At the same time, funding being pledged, I didn't say but pledged on climate is going up. And, and how do we then, as humanitarian and also development organizations working on issues related to displacement and housing land and property, how can we access also that kind of green climate funding in a meaningful way? Mm -hmm. I think many of us some years ago thought, okay, the green climate fund, that's the solution. And I think those of us who tried, and I know there are colleagues from UNHCR here, it's very difficult to access and you spend a lot of time to try to even get it. So I think for NGOs, we're not even trying. But I think it's more how do we then collaborate with those who are big enough and have a system to get access. And most of this funding is going to governments and states and not to UN or, or NGOs, etc. But the challenge we've seen with a lot of the funding from the uh, Green Climate Fund is that it doesn't necessarily reach the most vulnerable, neither the most vulnerable countries or the most vulnerable in those countries. Because the way it's set up, if you are a government that doesn't have much governance, you wouldn't be able to access the money. And then again, those money, those countries who get the money, who do they actually reach? So I think there's a lot of advocacy work that can be done to make those climate funds actually reaching the people most in need. But also I think, how do we, as humanitarian displacement uh, organizations, better access outside the traditional funding streams because we're still competing with everything else there. But how do we get these issues to be looked at? And as you heard, uh, some of the issues around age land and property, when you talk about land rights, it's not just about dealing with it when the crisis hits, but how can it be dealt with ahead? But also, I think as Daniel uh, underlined very clear, climate change also poses a new set of uh, ways we need to work both on policy and practice on housing land and property. And how do we get those funded? I think we all need to work together. And this is also where I think it's quite key that we use some of the convening and, and network places because I think it would be easier to get funding coming together. And also if you're able to show to donors that this is not just bits and pieces, but they're part of a bigger investment in, in, in this area. But I think that the, that's the mapping that was done 
been shared a few weeks back could help at least to get some of those um, those uh, information in. Thanks, Nina. Um, so I'd like to invite any questions from in the room or online. If anyone would like to <coughs> online raise your hand in this room, you can just sort of uh, indicate in another way if you had a question. Um, are there any, any questions for our panelists? Yeah, I got please. one. Um, so, you know, I would I would think that, that you know, you, Nina, you talk about the climate change thing. We talked a little bit just before this thing started about and you know, I come from Vancouver. OK, so climate change. The biggest effect is the middle of the province gets lit on fire every summer and, you know, a lot of it burns. And now they won't insure it, any of these properties anymore. And so I would argue that climate change became very, very important and got a lot more money when it became more personal to other people. Right. So you've got extremes of housing, land and property. You've got war. You've got climate displacement. But now you can't open the newspaper, read an article in any of the major cities in the world without people talking about the crisis of affordability and housing in regular cities. Yeah. And so it seems that is there some way to tie all of this together so that it's not just a third world problem or a you know poor people's problem or a you know a climate problem it's everybody's problem right and 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 that if you start to you've got this unique ability in a humanitarian way to talk about money right it's going to cost this much money to to you know take a billion people from the seashores and move them inland well where are you going to move them inland when there's not enough space inland for people already anyway so maybe that's kind of the way you get to the top of the heap when you start to show effects on private insurance companies and on industries and and just regular humans who already can't find a place to live that they can afford in a regular uh, scenario anyway right yeah so thank you for that that's, that's sort of making that link with you know some of these impacts of climate change yeah initially seen as a problem maybe for some people sure. over there but increasingly affecting yeah, and thinking about sustainable development goals for yeah, people right. across the world rather than just specifically focused on on particular groups is one part of it. And um, I see Jamal, do you want to come in and respond to that that point? No, I just I thank you very much, Jim. I just really wanted to to echo the sentiments of, of the colleague there um, by making a, a similar and related intervention um, based on some research that I would have previously undertaken back in the Caribbean. Um, I know I know the Caribbean is quite far from Vancouver, but I, I think the, the the lesson here is 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 quite quite relevant. One of the the things that I would have um, identified in that research, and I think it it was somewhat understood, but it was really to test that hypothesis. Um, it's it's really the the linkage between um, Kenya insecurity and the impetus to to the impetus that security of tenure gives to an individual to protect what is perceived as being securely theirs. So, so what I would have done, I would have looked at these different types of land tenure arrangements and, and done an analysis of the, the perception of tenure security that comes with each of these land tenure arrangements. And it was, it, it was quite obvious. I mean, I, mean I, I, I would have anticipated those results, but just to give you an idea of what the results would have highlighted overwhelmingly those individuals who would have invested in the recovery and reconstruction on their properties post-disaster without any support from government, without the support of insurance companies, were those individuals who had, dare I say, freehold tenure arrangements in their land and property. In other words, their perception of their land tenure arrangement was one that you know, they were willing to protect what they perceived to have been securely theirs, as opposed to individuals who would have been, you know, in, engaged in, let's say, tenancy at sufferance, which is a, a type of tenancy arrangement that was found on the ground there, even rental arrangements and even certain types of leasehold arrangements, their inclination and their willingness to really invest in and protect um, their, their, their housing, land, and property was not necessarily there. There was more of a, an interest or a willingness to wait on an insurance company or to wait on government assistance or some form of benevolence to really fund and, 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 and support their, their recovery and reconstruction. So I think that's a very important point, and I really appreciate you raising it. Thank you very much, Jim. Over. Thanks. Thanks, Jamal. And uh, yeah, it, it, maybe there's that link there between that security of tenure and, and the, the resilience you mentioned in your earlier remarks. Um, I noticed we had another question in the room, if you would like to, 
to ask you, please uh, introduce yourself and go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Elise um, from Global Network Oxford Society Organisations for Disaster Reduction, which is a mouthful for GNDR. Um, I wanted to pose a question um, to the colleague in Somalia. Um, you indicated about the, the guidelines and the toolkits that you had developed. I just wondered if you could unpack that a bit more. I thought it was a global um, guide and manual that was referenced, but I wasn't sure. And, and just how well has that worked and how has that changed work, especially with communities at risk of, of the issues of this seminar? Evelyn, would you like to respond to that one? Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. The toolkit is, is still a draft. <coughs> The toolkit was informed by an assessment. So like I mentioned, we had an HLP and flood assessment in Belatwin, a location in Somalia that is flood prone. And one of the gaps that was identified by the assessment was that HLP actors are not responding well to HLP issues within during natural disasters because they don't have the resources. And there was a specific recommendation to develop tools to address this. So the toolkit, um, provides uh, is, is split into two so it's I'll give you an example of one of the tools one the, one of the tools is on how to conduct an HLP assessment within a disaster so how do you identify HLP needs within the disaster then maybe then it's followed by how do you assess vulnerability within and then it has uh, it has case studies simulations that are drawn from practical cases. So for example, when we look at the, the second tool on vulnerability uh, assessment, it, it has a clear example from women, from, uh, from women who are left behind and men leave them behind during floods and the different issues that those women face because they they cannot move without a male relative, but then also the implication, the linkages between gender, um, their vulnerability, and then also the flood and HLP issues. So then the second part is a training. So it now comes up with modules that provide skills for HLP actors that are actually implementing HLP uh, interventions in those flood prone locations or drought affected or drought prone locations on how they can actually be able to understand. So a basic introduction to HLP, basic concepts around HLP and natural disasters. And then it's very, it, it, it follows closely. So from one module, you can actually be able to build up onto one. So that's, it's, it's in draft. And we're also going to have some examples from our recent, uh, for some modules also that are linked to the recent drought response, including real case studies drawn from our response in Somalia. So I hope that, that it's still in draft. We hope that Jim will be able to circulate this widely but it's very generic but also so that it can be contextualized for different areas of Somalia so it's generic for the national response but very can be contextualized say what Belletwain will do is different from what Jubaland that is drought prone will do or that uh, Baidoa that is famine prone uh, will do so that's just a quick overview on what it looks like we hope that when it's shared we can be able to get uh, some more feedback thanks Evelyn that's great and yeah let's we can talk after if you want to just make sure we, we share that with you. Now I'm aware of the time and I, but there's one more question in the room I want to turn to and then, um, then we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, okay, please, uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very short question. I'm um, an environmental and climate action advisor deployed to UNHCR America's uh, regional bureau. So I'm not only interested, I'm coming from disaster risk uh, reduction part and, and Swiss humanitarian aid. Um, but I'm not only interested in climate change issues, but also in environmental issues. So uh, how much is this topic attended concerning um, environmental contamination, industrial contamination, uh, agro-industry, uh, agro which sometimes uses um, like air, air how, how do you call it? Uh, pesticides, yeah, pesticides. Uh, to, 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 to like displace people and to expand their their, yeah. their, 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 their um, land. So how much is environmental uh, environmental aspects, which I think may be very, very important, or mining, uh, with contamin contamination of, of groundwater, so st stuff like that. How much is that, um, for, uh, is, is, is that on, on the radar or is, is it included in that to uh, topic? Thanks for that question. Hugo, would you like to respond to that? 
Hi, Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, greetings, greetings. No, just to say that mining, of course, has displaced a number of, 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 I mean, has caused displacement in northern Mozambique, as I was saying, and also these liquefied natural gas projects um, have uh, considerably, um, you know, the, the displaced the communities. Of course, these large companies that I won't mention here, obviously, you know, they do they do mention that they've been um, properly following the, the law and consulting community based on the DUAT uh, that I've mentioned, uh, this very innovative law that, you know, protects community and asks for participation with the community on, on decision of their, their, their faith. But in fact, uh, you know, civil society has been, uh, you know, uh, raising alarms that these have not been properly done. That is not uh, it's not actually consultation, but it's just informing them, uh, moving them, of course, with no participation of women. Um, so maybe just wanted to add that you, it's it's on our radar, yes, because um it, it it it's as we see it at the origin of a lot of the the grievances that have fueled conflict in the north of of, of Mozambique. Over back to you, Jim. Thank you, Hugo. Yeah, thanks. And just to say, you know. As I said at the beginning, this this event is part of a, a, a sort of a, a project we're working on, uh, trying to link policy, climate displacement, HLP, um, uh, in partnership with the government of Liechtenstein. And I think that is that's a key area we want to make sure we are kind of aware of as, as we're moving forward. So that's a really well noted point, and thank you for raising it. And um, we're going to close now. Nina, I just want to hand over to you for any uh, final uh, comment, and uh, and then and then we will sadly have to draw it to a close. Well. I'll try to be very quick, but I think when we go back to, to some of the presentations, uh, I think it was very clear that land and land rights and land tenure is kind of a key issue across all regions when we talk about the impacts of climate change and disasters. And the disasters that can also, of course, include environmental uh, disasters, but not so against law and the law. So. I think also, I think in particular, Daniel, who referred to three terminologies that those of you who have followed the climate change negotiation that come across. So he talked about migration, plan relocation and displacement. And I think these kind of groups of people on the move, we need to look at when we look from uh, the disaster climate change, because simplified, in so many situations, people will move, migrate to avoid being displaced. And how do we then deal with that without kind of jumping on trying to reduce the number of being displaced? Because displacement is also a survival mechanism. So I think this is where we also need to rethink a lot. We can learn a lot from what we've done in conflict work, but on prevention and preparedness, it's quite different than in the in the conflict situation. And also, I think we need to remember that when we work on climate change and disasters issues, also very often different. Uh, parts of the governments that are both legally responsible and the responders. So again, we need to work with different parts of local and national government than what we used to in conflict. But I still think there's so much we can learn from the long HLP work of conflict that relatively easily can be transferred mm -hmm. into this situation. So not stop with that something is different, but both being able to pick up what we can move over, but also really acknowledge the difference. And this is where I think like NRC, uh, we talk about displacement, but displacement you can't deal with without talking about migration and plan relocation. So how do we work on this together as a wider community? Uh, I'm very fascinated about the presentation today. I think we all learned a lot, but also see this huge pieces of work to be done on all geographical levels. So I'm really hoping that people who are both in the room, on the call, and uh, who have registered, that you will be interested in being part of some kind of informal exchange as we move forward, because I think that's the only way to move forward is that we work together and each of us can do a small piece, but that together could hopefully be some meaningful step forward. So yeah, using us and the project we have in Liechtenstein to kind of make this knowledge and protection gap a little bit smaller. Uh, but of course, one project is not going to solve the big issues. Mm. I don't think I'll take more time because we are in over time. Yeah. Do you want to close? Yeah, close? just final little final comments. Yeah, and um, I think that's exactly right. And it's so great to actually bring different perspectives. And even though we try not to, too often we have these silos of working and it's trying to 
you know, make clear that the links are there and how do we push forward on this. So yeah, please do, there's links in the chat for those online around how to sign up for mailing lists and our email addresses. If you're in the room, I think you might have put your names down so we can keep in touch. Um, it'd be great to sort of develop this uh, yeah, informal community further around this issue. And, and just want to say thanks so much to our, to our presenters. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Hugo, Evelyn, Daniel, Daniel for getting up in the middle of the night, really appreciated. Thank you, Jamal, for joining us as well. And for all those who've uh, commented, listened, hopefully there's some ideas and please let's keep in touch. Um, one final point just to mention in the chat, there was a call from someone working with the special rapporteur on that rights to adequate housing around a, a consultation. So if, if that's uh, something that could be of interest, please do contribute. That's looking at the links between adequate housing and climate change as well. So please do have a look on that. Um, Otherwise, thanks so much, and uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. But thanks so much for your attention. Cheers. Thank you, Jimmy. You guys can be circulate the next. Yes, we'll be sharing the recording and presentations. Good. Thank you. You should do this job. No, no. <laughs> oh hell no. <laughs> awesome. It's weird.